Please help me welcome to the stage, and he was here last year as well, Gov Hutchinson. All right. Morning. Good to be here. Glad to be here. What a beautiful spot. I think this is an upgrade over last year. What do you think? The location, very nice. Um, thanks. How many laws do you think the governor signed last year? 848. How many of them am I going to talk about? About 500. No, about 10. You know, just the top 10 or so. Um, actually, um, a lot of realtors still think I'm the governor of California, so it's, it's really strange. <laughs> At least once a quarter, someone asked me that very seriously. How's it, what's it like being the governor of California? I said, no. And they said, it's amazing you work for CAR, too. I swear to God. So anyway, um, anyway, before I talk about the brand new laws that just came out, there's some important new laws to talk about that I talked about last year that just came, became effective, right? So you should probably know those, too, don't you think? Uh, maybe the most important ones are the from the DRE or the 2018, the new advertising rules. Now you guys are gonna have on February 20th at 12 o'clock a nice uh, seminar, brown bag seminar on these rules because it really does take about an hour to talk about them. But let me just give you a preview and let me just tell you about like in three minutes what you really need to know about these new rules. First of all, did you, hear, did you catch the first thing I said, Department of Real Estate? It's going back to the DRE, yay. But you realtors, it really doesn't affect you, okay? Nobody cares if your sign says Cal BRE, BRE, or DRE. Just make sure it says license number, okay? So keep that in the back of your mind. I think the basic things to remember are that it's what's considered first contact materials where you have to put your license number has greatly expanded beyond just what we used to think of business cards, you know, website, and your f Facebook page. Now it's like everything, right? Flyers. Craigslist, newspaper, magazine, TV, you're on TV, you better have your license number there somewhere, videos, social media, every single Facebook post, every single tweet, you gotta think about this, and signs, of course. What do all these things need? They need three things. Name of your company, your name, your license number. You notice I didn't say the company's license number, it's not required, it's optional. Your name, your, uh, your license number and the broker's identity, the name of your company. You know there's a fourth thing that you need sometimes? The fourth thing is your status. What do I mean by that? I mean your status as a realtor, licensee, broker. In other words, if the name of your company has the word real estate in it or realty or estates or properties, it's pretty obviously a real estate company, right? But what if you, the name of your company is the John Smith Company? listed by the John Smith Company, you know, for sale John Smith Company. You'd have to write somewhere in there that that's a brokerage office, that you're an agent or a broker, something like that. Gen or if it's a nationally recognized, you know, Remax Century 21, you don't have to do it either. But if it's just a generic name that doesn't show it, that's the fourth thing you need, okay? Are there any things that can still be generic? Yes. A for sale sign can still just have the broker's name. But if you put your name there, then you also have to put your license number. What about an open house sign, this way to the open house? Well, that can still be completely generic. But if you put your name there, you've triggered everything else. Company name, your name, and your license number, OK? That's a quick overview of the basic things. You know, in the last month, when I drive around, I look at signs. I'd say 9 out of 10 are not right, you know? So you might want to start complying. Some of you are thinking, hey, there are 200,000 realtors. How many people can possibly work at the DRE? They're never going to catch me. So which realtors are going to get in trouble? The ones that get turned in by other realtors. So, <laughs> and I know the DRE is here, and they can address this, but uh, go ahead and look at your competitors' signs, and if you don't, you know, turn them in. They'll be glad to hear from you, okay? Uh, by the way, the other thing, remember, is there's special rules for teams Teams, if you want to market with a team name. Let's say I, I live in Culver City. Let's say I was a realtor who worked for Culver City Realty. And I take a listing listed by Gov Hutchinson, Culver City Realty. There's no rule that, that says my name can't be bigger than my, than my company name if my company doesn't care. But if I have a team, the Hutchinson team at Culver City Realty, I cannot make my team name more prominent than the company name. What does prominent mean? To me, it's the size of the letters. What else could it mean, right? 
or my logo can't be bigger than the company logo. That's if I choose to market as a team, and all team advertising has to have the real name of at least one of the team members and has to have the license number of that person, and a team name has to have the word team, group, or associates. I can't call my team name Hutchinson Realty. I'd have to call it the Hutchinson Realty team, right? And I can't, what if I want to call my team the, the, the Hutchinson Gang? Doesn't that sound cool? I can't do it. All right, enough on that. Another thing that became effective this year is all the marijuana stuff. Marijuana is legal, yay. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but did you know there's now a whole licensing scheme? So if you want to, I mean, do any of you realtors have clients come up to you and say, hey, could you find me a house that's good for growing marijuana? Or did any of you realtors start advertising yourself as, I'm the marijuana realtor, call me, you know? <laughs> you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful because to be in the, in the business of, of growing, selling, manufacturing, transporting marijuana, you need multiple licenses. You need state, you need local. It's not just Prop 64, I can become a drug dealer now. No, you can't. Um, and I'm telling you this because in case your clients, some clients have crazy ideas about this and you have to sort of get a lawyer, make sure you're okay to do this. And you know, the city in question, the locality in question doesn't have to license it. What if you're in a city that doesn't provide these licenses and you need your medical marijuana? You gotta go to another place where they are licensed. Go to Humboldt, they'll be licensed, I guarantee you. I mean, it's, go to Grass Valley. It's, it's, it's named that for a reason, by the way, anyway. Um, <laughs> You can do that, okay? What about these medical marijuana nonprofit collectives that are out there? They're gonna be phased out. Even to provide medical marijuana, the provider's gonna have to get, be licensed, okay? All Prop 64 says you guys, everyone who's over 21, can grow six plants inside and keep all your grow. Or when you're moving around, not at your home, you can have on you at any time, 28.5 grams. I think it's an ounce. That's all Prop 64 says. It doesn't give you any authority to, to grow it outside, to smoke it outside, to sell it. You can have an ounce, six plants, and landlords can say no. Landlords say, I don't care about Prop 64, I don't care about medical marijuana, not here. They can absolutely say no. So you're really only right is if you own your own home, grow six plants inside. That's really all you can definitely do, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. We have a whole Q&A on this to explain all the details, but you just can't do whatever you want, as some people think, right? Even medical marijuana. The good news is the federal government just extended their rule that says federal resources can't be used to prosecute people for violation of the federal anti-marijuana laws if they are in compliance with their state's medical marijuana laws. Did you notice I didn't say recreational? They actually came out with a policy statement to all U.S. attorneys out there, feel free to go ahead and enforce the federal anti-marijuana laws against recreational use. In other words, even if you're in compliance with California's recreational use, it doesn't automatically protect you. So we'll see how the U.S. attorneys in California, how aggressive they are. I don't think they'll be that aggressive, to tell you the truth. The Colorado U.S. attorney already announced, I'm not going to be real aggressive here, you know, that's... That's Colorado, I don't know how, how that is here. All right, a couple more things that I talked about last year that took effect, remember, do I have any landlords or property managers in the room? Did you give all of your tenants the bed bug form yet? All right, that was required. Did any of you property managers or landlords, remember if you have a multi-unit property, multi-unit rental property, two or more units, and each tenant is paying their own water bill because they're individually metered, if that's you, you have to give each of your tenants another new form, the water meter form. So those are two forms you must give to your tenants. Bed bug form, every tenant. Water meter form, some tenants. So those are things I talked about last year that became effective this year, okay? Let me talk about brand new things. You all have a booklet, right? If you wanna follow along, um, there's a part and it says 2018 California laws. You don't have to follow along if you don't want to. You can just listen to me. But if you want to follow along with me, I'm just going to hit some of the, some of the, the good news is there's not a lot of really onerous new laws. 
I think the, the most onerous new laws are the ones I already mentioned. You know, all these new advertising rules and limitations on marijuana and all that stuff. You'll see the ones I'm going to talk about, there's nothing too horrible. That's good, right? Do you want horrible new laws? Right. Thank goodness. Okay. Um, so if you're all looking at it, the very first page says broker practice trust funds. There's a new rule that says brokers, if you have a trust account and you want to authorize any of your employees to have access to the trust account, it used to be you had to get fidelity bond coverage for the employee. Now you have a choice of that or getting insurance instead. No big deal. Next page, it says disclosures HOA. Have you ever been gouged by an HOA? Isn't it crazy? You take a listing and they charge you $800 to provide these documents. Did you know the law says they can only, they can only charge their out-of-pocket costs? How much could that possibly be? 50 bucks? How do they get away with the $800? Because they say, if you don't, do it, we're not, if you don't pay, we're not going to do it. Theoretically, at, at close of escrow, the seller could then go sue their old HOA to say, you charge me too much, prove that you actually incurred that cost. I don't think many sellers do that. What's changed now, this year, HOAs on the billing form that they give you, they have to tell the seller, hey, seller, if you've already got any of these documents, you, you, we can't charge you for all of them. In other words, just tell us the ones you need, and we'll only charge you for those. So that's one good thing, right? Also, it says, also, if you live in an association like I do, and the annual report that the HOA sends to its members each at the end of each year, they have to now provide a schedule that shows how much they charge for each, you know, how much for the CCNRs, the rules, the budget, the reserve study, the articles, the bylaws. Why is this good? Because you'll be able to see how much they're going to gouge you before they actually gouge you. So maybe you can get together with your fellow residents of this HO common interest development and go to your HOA and board of directors say, you're, gonna, you're adding $800 to the cost of my sale if I decide to sell. That's too much. Let's change the schedule. So there's a couple little good things, all right? Um, and that was CAR sponsored. Next page, you keep going along, disclosure, Megan's Law. Have you ever heard, thought about that some Megan's Law thinks, I mean, it's, it's a real, it's a real uh, it covers maybe too much. It covers everyone from the rapist that we all hate to the person who maybe when they were drunk 50 years ago, you know, exposed himself on the street or something like that. Maybe it's not as bad as the rapist. Anyway, the point is, there are going to be three categories of registered sex offenders. Really bad, not so bad, and not too bad, whatever. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's probably not the official terminology. But the point is, there will be a way to get yourself taken off the list after 10 years, 20 years. If it's a really bad thing, you'll never be able to get yourself off. The point is, there's a process. This doesn't affect you selling houses. You, all you do is selling house, you, the purchase contract tells the client to look at the database. You as a realtor should probably not look at the database because it'll tell you things you don't want to know, like where all the sex offenders are. Now you have not knowledge and I have to disclose. Remember there was a San Diego case. It was, it was not appealed, but there was a San Diego case where the issue was, does the, listing have to, does the listing agent have to disclose if the seller is a sex offender? The agent said, I don't think I have to. The guy's leaving. Guess what? The buyer moved in, the neighbor came over and said, wow, we're so glad you bought the sex offender house. <laughs> buyer freaks out, sues the agent, but the good news is the agent won. The judge agreed, said, the guy left. No big deal. The buyer said, the house is stigmatized. The court said, get over it, you know. <laughs> People will forget eventually, you know, so. Uh... Next item, it says, disclosures, private transfer fees. You will occasionally come across when you're listing a house that was part of a new subdivision, probably in the 90s or early aughts, that you'll come across a private transfer fee. This is an obligation of a realtor, a seller to actually disclose this to the buyer. All this law is, is the disclosure form is now not just going to disclose how much the fee is, it's going to disclose the impact of this. And by the way, the impact of this is Fannie and Freddie basically say we won't buy loans on properties that have private transfer fees if they were put on the property after a certain date. Anyway, this doesn't really affect you. It doesn't happen very often, but you should be aware that that form just changed slightly. All right, what else is going on? Uh, let's keep going. It says disclosures, liability, exemption. 
you'll be happy to know that there's already a law in the books that says if you as a realtor convey to a buyer a third party report from a contractor or a termite or something like that, you are not liable for any mistakes in that report. Well, you'll be happy to know they've added another category of third party reports that you're not liable for and that are roofing contractors reports. Okay, keeping going, if any of you realtors are employers, I know a lot of you hire independent contractors, but if any of you have five or more employees, look at the next one, it says employment criminal history. You cannot ask for your applicant's criminal history up front. You can't even check it up front. You have to wait until you actually offer them the job to check. And then if you do check it, you cannot use against them any convictions that have been expunged or any arrests that have not led to conviction or if the crime they're guilty of is not related to the job that you're offering them. Maybe their only criminal offense was a DUI 20 years ago and you're hiring them for a job that does not involve any driving. So you probably aren't supposed to use the DUI against them in, in deciding whether to hire them, okay? See what I'm saying? Um, there's some more employment stuff, which I'll let you read on your own. Let's see what else is interesting. Salary history. Once again, most of you don't hire employees, you hire independent contractors, but if you ever hire someone for a salaried position, this new law says you can't ask them how much they used to make at their previous job. And if they ask you how much is the, how much do people get paid at the job I'm applying for, you have to tell them. So, no big deal. Next one, government, as you know, I told you the DRE is coming back, so that's good. HOA disclosure, I already talked about. It. HOA solar energy systems. Let's say you live in a condo, right? You live in a condo and you want to install solar panels on the roof. Of course, you don't own the, you don't own the roof, do you? You own the air inside. The, the roof is common area. So the HOA up until now could have said, nope, no solar. New law says an HOA cannot have a blanket prohibition on putting in solar. In other words, maybe you're the only person who actually lives underneath this particular part of the roof the HOA sort of has to reasonably accommodate you if you want to have solar panels, even though you don't own that. It's common area. It used to be to allow you to have exclusive use of the common area, they'd need a, a two-thirds vote of each individual owner, but they can't make it that strict anymore. The point is, you can probably get away with insisting on having solar, depending on the circumstances. It's not that 100%, but, but it's, it's interesting if any of you are considering that. Next one, home inspectors swimming pool safety. Aha, uh -huh. home inspectors don't like this. But now home inspectors on their inspections have to call out whether, if the property they're inspecting has a swimming pool, they have to call out if the swimming pool has any of the required pool safety features and how many. Did you know every swimming pool built after 96 and every swimming pool that if you already have a pool and you are remodeling the pool, the pool you have must have one of six safety features. This law says it now must have two. What are the six safety features? A pool enclosure, a pool cover, a fence around the pool, an alarm that opens up every time you open the door to your house that opens onto the pool that goes off or the door is open a self-latching, self-closing door on any door that opens to the swimming pool that has the latch at least 54 inches high. Or the sixth one is you can have an alarm that basically goes off every time something goes into the water. That'd be pretty annoying, don't you think? I don't think many people have that one. Anyway, you now have to have two of those going forward, not on your existing pools, but going forward. You have to have that, and home inspectors have to call that out in their inspections. Did you hear about the recent case, I just love talking about this, where a realtor had a listing of a vacant property and the swimming pool was empty and she put in the MLS remarks, be careful about the empty swimming pool. Even though she did that, a buyer comes along and gets the bright idea, I'm gonna stand on the diving board over the empty swimming pool so I can see over the fence. This, when he was standing on the diving board, the diving board broke, he fell I laughed too. He fell and uh, he got seriously hurt. He's okay. But he sued the realtor. Said, 
this was a, I'm suing you for two reasons. Number one, you should have disclosed the defective diving board. And they asked him in court, I said, did you, buyer, look at the diving board before you stepped on it? Yes. Were there any obvious cracks or defects? No. Well, then how was the realtor supposed to know, right? Their eyes are no better than yours. They didn't see anything. How would they know? So that part of his argument was dismissed. His other argument was a, an empty swimming pool is a dangerous condition, so the listing agent should have taken precautions. Like what? Like putting up a fence, a temporary fence around it. So that was his argument. But you'll be happy to know the court's analysis was there's no liability here. The court's analysis was you're only guilty of negligence if the harm that was suffered was reasonably foreseeable. And the judge basically said, the court basically said, it was not reasonably foreseeable that anyone would be this stupid to actually <laughs> stand on the empty diving board over the empty swimming pool. Therefore, the warning in the MLS was sufficient. Isn't, that, isn't it great when a realtor wins a case? I love talking about realtors winning. Yes. Which part? No. No, no, the pool thing is, if you're, let's say you're remodeling a pool. So you need a, you're doing a, a remodel that requires a permit. The remodeled pool has to have two of these six safety features. Also, builders building new homes with pools have to have these, and the home inspectors have to call that out. Okay, anyway, moving along in our little thing, there's a lot of housing bills which are good, but I'm not gonna talk about them. Um, if you keep turning pages, you come across something that says housing accessory dwelling units. These are a fancy name for granny flats. I told you about a law last year that makes it easier to get approval for second units. That law was expanded more this year to make it even easier. So if you in San Diego or whatever city you're in want to build a second unit attached to your house or separate detached to the house, the city that you're in cannot be as strict as it used to be in asking you to say things like, oh, you have to build a car porch, you have to have three extra car parking spaces, you have to have a separate utility connection. I told you last year they said you can't require carports, can't require separate utility connections. Now it's been expanded to say can't require more than one new parking space to accommodate the second unit. You can't, and here's the one, some cities and HOAs prohibit tandem parking, you know, parking right behind each other. This law actually says if you have a second unit, you don't have to follow that rule if there's an anti-tandem parking rule where you are. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and the point is, what I'm really telling you is, um, if you or your client wants to add a second unit and you're getting pushback from the city, you might want to call a lawyer, call the hotline, and we'll, we'll compare what the, what the restrictions are. In other words, this is a state law that supersedes local laws to say this is the state law, this is what a city can require to authorize you to build a second unit. So if your locality is requiring more, you would tell us and we would get involved and, and, uh, and help out with that, okay? Um, net keeping going along, landlord tenant. Here's a new one for you landlords. You must disclose to all new tenants going forward if the property is in a flood zone. Not existing tenants, new tenants. Fortunately, on the new residential lease form, recently updated, there's a new paragraph, checkbox, yes or no, is the property in a flood zone? You may say to me, how do I know if I'm in a flood zone? Get an NHD report. I mean, if you already have an NHD report because you bought the property three years ago, of course, they sort of remap flood zones, don't they? So the natural hazard industry is very happy about this law because it almost forces landlords to periodically get NHD reports because anytime you have a new tenant, you must disclose to the new tenant if the property's in a flood zone. What if you're using a lease form, but it's not the CAR lease form? Shame on you is point number one, yes. Um, but we're also gonna have a one page thing you can attach to whatever lease form you're using to make this flood hazard zone disclosure, okay? 
Turn the page. The next thing, landlord tenant, immigration status. I know none of you landlords would ever do this, but they went to the trouble of passing a law that says, not only can you not just ask a prospective tenant for their immigration status, if you do know their immigration status, you can't disclose or threaten to disclose their immigration status to anyone as a means to intimidate her or harass. I'm trying to visualize what that means. I guess that what that means, landlord says to a tenant, I'm going to double your rent. Don't complain or I'll turn you in. See what I'm saying? Don't do that, okay? Um, that's really what that's saying. Um, the number one question we get on landlord-tenant on the legal hotline now is pets. Cyst, you know, service animals. You'll notice there's nothing in here talking about that. I mean, it does say landlord, tenant, pets. Certain HCD housing must have pets, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, tell, I'm giving you bad news in that we tried to sponsor a bill that would define what companion animals really are, and it didn't get through. So you're stuck where you are before. I mean, if you're a landlord, you can definitely say no pets, right? You have to allow service animals, but service animals are pretty clear, right? Those are dogs that have been trained to perform a task, and you're entitled to some certification that the tenant is disabled so that they require an animal to help them with this task. I mean, it's sort of cut and dried if they meet those requirements. But the problem, of course, are companion animals that aren't trained. What if your tenant shows up and says, I, have a, I need a companion animal, and here, meet my new gorilla that is my companion animal. <laughs> meet my mongoose, meet my python, meet my chicken, my turkey, meet my three Dobermans I have to have, two are not enough, you know? Can you as a landlord say no? Well, the answer is you have to reasonably accommodate. Is it reasonable to accommodate a gorilla? No, you're okay there. What about a pit bull? You don't mind pit bulls, but your insurance company says, we will not insure your property if it has a pit bull. So you go to the tenant and say, I'm sorry. The tenant says, I don't care about your stupid insurance company. I want a pit bull. Who wins that argument? The pit bull. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> the point is, what we have found is it depends on the judge. Some judges will say, well, since you're going to lose your ins insurance, it's reasonable for you to say to the tenant, get a different companion animal. Other judges have said, have you checked every single insurance company in the state of California? Yeah, I found one 300 miles away that will insure me if I quadruple what I pay. And they'll say, well, then pay it. That's reasonable. You see what I'm saying? There's no rules. It's case by case. We need rules. I'm telling you this just to get you mad and upset because we don't, still don't have rules. We're pushing. We're now we're trying to get the Department of Fair Housing involved. Did you guys, any of you see on TV yesterday, the lady trying to get on the plane with the peacock on her shoulder. I mean, seriously? You were wondering about that. Is that the only companion animal she could possibly get? Um, Keeping going, we're almost done here on the uh, Pace Lean Consumer Protections. Getting back to solar energy, the previous gentleman, he talked about the quote unquote scam that I agree with that some of these Pace Leans are. There's a new law that doesn't even just apply to pace liens. It says, in general, if you are getting, want to get solar energy on your property, the solar energy provider must now provide a, a pretty detailed disclosure document, which has a lot of good things like, how did they arrive at their estimate of how many panels you need? How did they arrive at how much energy they think your panel is going to provide? How much money do you have to save on your electricity to justify this? Are there going to be any new fees you have to pay the utility? Um, what's the difference in cost comparing side by side between leasing and buying? So I think it's a, it's a good consumer thing. It applies whether they're using PACE financing or any other financing. Consumers who want to get solar, uh, solar energy, there's a new disclosure form that the, must be provided by the solar energy provider. Now, if you turn the page, the next one, it says Paceling Consumer Protections. If the solar energy or whatever improvement is being provided by a Pace provider, this law says, and this all became effective January 1st, has to verbally talk to the consumer before they commit to the contract. First of all, you have a three-day right of rescission even after you sign the contract. It has to actually talk to the consumer and explain in verbally and you can have other people on the call explaining all your rights, your consumer rights you have 
regarding pace lanes, and there are quite a few of them. Um, that is pretty much it for the new laws that you really need to know about. I think you'll agree that nothing too drastic or dramatic that's gonna kill you. Like I said, the, probably the most significant ones are the advertising rules, which no one is complying with, and I think you need to start complying with. Um, you don't need new signs, by the way. You can get riders and stickers. Get your Sharpie out if you want to, and you know, just start making changes. But, but I already know realtors who've been fined. I already know real, it's not like there's a grace period. I know realtors who've already been fined hundreds of dollars. So you gotta comply with these laws. They are important. Um, as far as new forms to cover this, I, the, so other than the, you know, the new form on bed bugs, the new form on water meters, the new form on flood hazard, all of that has been incorporated into the lease form. So that's a nice change, right? All this stuff is, is together on the lease form, so be, be ready for that. Uh, are there any other new forms? Are there any new forms you should know about? There's a new team agreement form. I recommend if you're part of a team, maybe you should put your relationship with your team leader in writing, talking about what your rights are, responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. What if I leave the team? What if I leave the company? All that kind of stuff. We have a new team agreement. We have a new form called the property images agreement. If you hire a photographer to list or video your, your listing, you might want to get a written contract with the photographer that basically says, you, the realtor, own the pictures and the videos. Because if they own them, they'll start charging you for the next 20 years when these pictures, wherever these pictures appear all over the world. So that's a good thing, right? And the third new form that came out is called the amendment. You're saying, why do we need that? We already have an addendum. Why do we need an amendment? The, Amendment B, let's say you're in escrow, you're already in escrow, and you want to change something. You want to ask the other side for a change. You want to propose a change, maybe an extension of the closing date or something like that. Well, if you use the addendum form, it's kind of awkward because the addendum form is really just supposed to be adding stuff to a document you already have. I don't have enough room on my offer. I'm going to put the extra stuff on the addendum. I don't have enough room on my transfer disclosure statement. I'm going to use the addendum to add more material. But we're not really talking about that. We're talking, I'm not adding stuff. I want to propose a change to what we currently are in escrow or you're currently in a lease form. And you know what's good about this form? It, there's a three-day cancellation. So if you submit this amendment to the other side, you're basically saying, if, you don't, if I don't hear from you from th three days, I guess you don't want my amendment. You know what I'm saying? So, whereas if you submit an addendum with a proposed change, there's no ex expiration period, so you can submit an addendum, you don't hear back, a month later, the other side calls you up and says, we just signed your addendum. And you say, I don't even remember what I asked for a month ago. And they say, well, we want it now. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to use this new form, I recommend it. New amendment. So those are the only three new forms that came out. That's not bad, right? See, it's a good year for forms. It's a good year for new laws. It's a happy year. It's a happy year. You're all gonna have a great year. As the previous speaker said, if you make less than 157.5, you have another 20%, you're gonna take off your taxes. And if you make more than 200,000, we say, good for you. No tax break, but good for you. So everybody's happy, right? All right, I'll see you next year. Thank you very much.